All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. This is our second show. So starting off with our uh, discussions, first of all, uh, apologies for this morning. I could not uh, have my discussion. I think the reason was very simple. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I stayed off and I did not touch anything related to COVID. So I was actually not prepared this morning to be able to talk about something. Although I had been seeing that the results were great for India, that they're going downwards now, the cases. I also saw that Goa's cases were going down. Um, at the same time, I saw that other, so there was lots of, uh, messaging that hey goa is going downwards in cases because they're using ivermectin but i started looking at other uh, states as well and i saw they were going down as well with the ivermectin uh, sorry with or without the ivermectin so there is a human behavior part as well i'm sure that goa would show results as well but i want to make sure that we stay balanced so we don't jump on some numbers that would not make sense afterwards uh, so we'll see more as the Goa continues to differentiate itself. Uh, but there were cases generally going down across India. So that was an interesting observation. So I thought that was useful to discuss, but I just didn't have enough material this morning to uh, join and discuss. So my apologies that I missed it. So from tomorrow, I will be, uh, <laughs> I will be there. So with this, I hope you're all good. Uh, you had a fun time as well, Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. I hope you enjoyed it. And let's start our discussion. Margaret is here. So Margaret says, hello, back. Back to you as well. Closet Picker says, third. Absolutely. Steve was first today. So Steve, hello. And now let's have some. <clears throat> so Rajesh says, Goa under serious storm yesterday and day before. The weather-based storm. So let's start our question. Rice Bunny Local says, does delayed vaccine make stronger antibodies? Good question. So two answers. First answer is from the trials. Original trial for majority of the vaccines had no delay or not didn't have delay more than three to four weeks. And they had shown that the vaccine become effective a couple of weeks after the second dose. Then came UK. UK decided, at that time they were criticized about this. I even thought that they are not doing right from a data point of view. But I still am very proud of this, that when I did the discussion, I drew the mechanism, I still remember it. And I said, from a mechanism point of view, it seems like they'll be fine. And the mechanism is this, that when you get the vaccine, you will continue to make antibodies for some time. So even if it is 90 days after, there were antibodies. And then when you do a booster, those cells would proliferate further. So to answer your question, Rice Bunny, stronger antibodies is not a question. There is no stronger antibody itself is not a mechanism or a concept. If you said, will the system have will one dose continue to have increased efficacy as the time passes, then at least UK trials have shown that yes, at least up to 90 days or 84 days, the efficacy continues to increase. And then when you give the second dose, that improves the efficacy once again further. So UK is showing that delay is fine. Denazir Etizol says, Question, doctor, what are your thoughts about taking anticoagulants like apixaban after getting the second dose of AstraZeneca? So if the first dose did not do that, cause that issue, then ideally, in theory, the second dose should not do that either. But yes, talk with your doctor. I have done a discussion about what are the kind of anticoagulants that can be taken and should be kept um, at hand, doctors should be aware as well, especially for women who are under 50 years of age. So I would not suggest that somebody just start taking blood thinners because blood thinners can cause strokes and other issues by themselves. So this should be with the doctor's advice, but this should be planned out. <laughs> Truffle says, good evening. Thanks for all the time you spent to prepare. You're very welcome. I, I like it.
Joy Fisher says, howdy from South Jersey from Joyful Bean. Hello back to you as well. Today, I'm a Joyful Bean as well after the three days off. Um, Alex Hunter says, what would be the potential molecular mechanism of headache that lasts for weeks? Headache is such a common uh, problem that there are so many mechanisms for headache that if I just try to say, you know what, I'm going to figure out what is the right one mechanism, I probably will not be able to. But uh, just to give you some idea, now, because we're talking in the context of the vaccines and the infections, so I would connect that as well. But generally, look, headaches, so let's say this is a person, and now, of course, there is the nervous tissue in there, correct? And then in addition to the nervous system tissue present, brain is, an, is a, a tightly controlled structure, right? So because it has a wallet outside, it has bone outside. If you see our body structure, wherever our body thinks that something is sensitive and needs to be safe, safe or saved from the external environment, it puts those in the bone. So brain is inside the bone, the chest protects the lung and heart. But then if you see the remaining tissues, for example, muscles are outside of the bones and so on. So one, there is not a lot of space here for pressures to increase or for swellings to occur or for blood flow to increase or to re reduce drainage. We have a limited space. And if there is any issue with the space in terms of space, there is an increased need. For example, the need can be increased when the drainage from here is reduced. So now more fluids are accumulating there, will have headache. Or if there is more blood coming in, for example, high blood pressure, and we would have headaches. Or there are electrolytes that are not working correct correctly. Why? Because we know that a neuron, so let's say this is a neuron, a neuron, when it is functioning, <laughs> this is this looks like a foresty neuron. But anyways, it is a neuron. Uh, I'll make it look a little bit better by doing this. So let's say we have a neuron. In this neuron, the conduction of the electrical activity needs sodium, needs potassium, needs calcium, and so on. So if those electrolytes plus fluids because fluids are necessary for moving these electrolytes in and out and through the neurons. So if fluids are incorrect, the amount of electrolytes in, are incorrect, we might get headache, we might get even numbness or even disorientation. So that could be one reason. Then, of course, in the context of the vaccine, when the vaccine or the infection occurs, what will happen is with that, the cytokines will go, the inflammatory system, things will go to brain and that would cause inflammation or increased pressure or irritation of the nerves and that can cause headache. Then some folks who are, let's say, thinking a lot, their scalp tissue, the, the muscle, scalp tissue I'm calling it, the muscle of the head. So look at my eyebrows here. So if I am stressed out and I'm like this for most of the time, this muscle here, which is going through the whole head, when it is staying contracted for a long time, it would become painful. And that also elicits itself as a headache. This is like if you hold your arm up with a brick on it. So or let's say if I have my coffee over here and I just hold it, hold it up like this for the whole day, eventually my arm is going to start hurting. Similarly, if my scalp muscle is I'm stressed and it is kind of contracted like this, I would start having a headache. Similarly, the big muscle in the back, the trapezius. Trapezius muscle is also very much uh, connected with the, so it comes and connects here under the skull bone. Then it goes and connects with the, with the shoulders. It's like a kite muscle. And then it goes down and connects in, in the back as well. Usually trapezius, trapezius or back ache is an indication that we might develop headache as well because if we are stressed out and the trape trapezius is stressed, then the scalp muscle would be stressed as well. So that would cause headache. Then we know that headache can be caused by um, migraines. 
which are blood vessel um, dilatations or unnecessary constriction of the blood vessel, changing the blood pressure out of the norm, causing headache. Then um, we saw that the in the case of um, this virus, when the olfactory nerve is implicated, when it is infected, the olfactory bulb and the glymphatic drainage is not correct and the lymph, lymph flow is not correct, then that causes headache as well. Then in case of vaccine, for example, if we are talking about adenovirus vaccines, these vaccines can cause clotting issues. And once again, how rare? We say very rare. But even today, um, I don't want to uh, play her whole message, but there is a mother from New York who has uh, been leaving my, me messages about her daughter who developed clotting and who had been in ICU and now she's back and the doctor said she's now she had a gatoban when she was in the ICU and now she's in comedine and she's going to be like that for a couple of months and the doctors say that clots are big enough that she needs time to recover and her mother uh, I was kind of uh, she of course it is her daughter so she said she's not the same as she was so she left me a message so these clotting issues or blood pressure regulation issues can cause long duration headache as well or persistent headache too. So headache is such an, a big topic that for me, if I kept talking and discussing various mechanisms, it, it would take hours. Uh, there are psychological reasons, electrolyte reasons, the tissue reasons, the bleeding reasons, the, the pressure reasons, and so on. So um, good question, Alex but a very big topic. Some of the ideas are here. We can get headache just by being stressed. So let's see, there's a question from Ali G. Is it fine to start aspirin 75 milligram for women after second dose of AstraZeneca after how many days one should start taking it and how long one should take it? So I avoid specific answers, but when I talk about my own family, I kept giving more than 75 milligram aspirin through the whole time. And you saw that there were so many indications that there would have been thrombosis. Um, so I feel for my patients, for my family, I use it just to reduce that. The important point is, Blood thinners, although aspirin is pretty benign, but still blood thinners can cause bleeding. So one must uh, look at their existing drugs. They should talk with their doctor to see if they have any bleeding tendencies or other liver issues and so on, and then take it. So it has to be taken with, with uh, care with your doctor's advice. But yes, yeah, some sort of management has to be done when there is a possibility of thrombocytopenia. <clears throat> John Snyder says, I thought Brazil was looking better today. That's good. <laughs> Franz says, donut button, even Luffy paws for it for treat. Yes. So paw the like button and you'll get a treat. The treat will be that my videos would show up again and again. So uh, did I just contradict my own request? OK, so. Uh, John Riaz says, Dr. B, is it true that if there is an alternative effective therapy that works, ivermectin and fluvoxamine, the government can't legally grant EUAs for vaccine per the EUA stat statutes? Yes. And it is said, um, it is written on the CDC as well. And it's not a new news, at least with the cool beans here. We've been discussing this for eight, nine months. If today CDC says here is a treatment for this condition, then emergency use authorizations, emergency use authorizations do not make sense anymore. So they would not approve it because then they cannot do EUAs. The problem is they are not approving it in a bad way. I would have thought they, they should say, you know what, give EUA to this drug as well. Fine, because it is an FDA-approved drug, 
but it is not approved for this. So let's give it an emergency use authorization as a off-label use and kind of make it a little better than off-label use and a little less taboo and little less, let's be a little less against it. But when I cite WHO's statement, when Goa said that we're going to use ivermectin and WHO came out right away and said, safety is not known. And this is, I could not believe it. That to me tells me there is active undermining of the other possibilities. Because let's say WHO looks at that and says, you know what? We don't really know if it is effective or not, but they should know it is more safe than Tylenol. And they should know if it has placebo effect, even that is useful. They, there is something in people's hand to say, OK, I can trust it would work. That in itself changes the human psychology. They could not even tolerate that much. So um, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, there is a super chat as well. So thank you very much, Rajesh. So Rajesh said, Dr. Bean has been giving me a lot of wrinkles in my brain, and I am loving it. <laughs> thank you very much. The more the wrinkles, the the more the intelligence. And yes, so good. Um, Akshay Agarwal says, sir, I, long, I, along with my 10 friends, took the co-vaccine vaccine. Everyone except me had some sort of side effects. Does this mean that I didn't develop immunity in comparison to them? No, not at all. That simply means that your body was able to handle it in a different way. That doesn't mean you didn't have immunity. This, I was protesting when even CDC started saying that, hey, the side effect should just mean that your immunity is working. So then what about the people who didn't have the side effect now? Should they start getting worried? So no, don't need to be worried. Your immune system is responding. And this is a situation that even my class fellows who are doctors are reaching out and saying, hey, Mubin, I got the vaccine and I didn't get the side effect. Did I have the vaccine? Is it working or not? And so one, our immune system can decide that, hey, you know what? I'm not too much bothered about it. I'll just get trained and I'm fine. It is possible that T helper cytotoxic, sorry, T cytotoxic pathway is taken, which is less symptomatic. So there are, it is possible some innate arm has worked better as well. So there are so many reasons for not having the uh, symptoms or having less symptoms. And we saw that in the vaccine trial, about 50% of the people don't have, or not 50, 20, 25% of the people after the first dose have no symptoms. That doesn't mean they don't have any efficacy. So no, you're fine. Liza says, is B16172, B16172, that's a long name, not as important as 61. Okay, so you're saying, is B617 not as important as 618? Why all the buzz about 6? Because 618 is mostly newer and it is mostly confined to India. 617 has traveled outside as well. So, And that was the first one detected. So it's just whatever media catches on. Jody, Jody says, question, what about the fact that a new variant in vivo could divide in the system faster than the antibodies could ramp up from vax, like within a day or two? So I talked about it. And I think <laughs> I may be the first one to talk about that. And um, that may become something that people run with. My point is not that. But imagine if a virus becomes so infective that as soon as it lands in the in the oropharyngeal area or nose or mouth, it starts infecting the cell very fast, come out and then infect the next one very fast. And it just does that cycle so rapidly that before the immune system can wake up 24 to 48 hours, open their eyes and say, okay, I'm gonna have to control this thing. So this is assuming the person was infected before or vaccinated. So before even that, protective trained immune system gets a chance to wake up and respond, virus may have caused a lot of damage. So that is possible. Scarlett Monahan says, should an unvaccinated person mixing with others use the higher doses unvaccinated? 
4 milligram per kilogram of fibromectin for prophylaxis, or is this dose only recommended for health workers? I would appreciate your guidance. This higher dose is useful for the new variants because they are more infective and they can do this thing very quickly, cycling from one cell to the next one. So we need a higher concentration of the drug to stand in their way. So that is why a higher dose is uh, 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 recommended nowadays. It has nothing to do with the standing next to a vaccinated person or not vaccinated person. This was, I almost talk about it every day. And even then people just keep leaving comments. I stand next to a vaccinated person and I start having periods. I next uh, stand next to a vaccinated person and I heard somebody had abortion. Uh, you stand next to a vaccinated person and you can smell them smelling bad. <laughs> there are just so weird messaging. And there is no, there is no uh, science behind all of that. This is those weird doctors who were at some point granted degrees for some sort of medicine and now have become gurus to provide such strange information and then people run with it. So the, this idea of vaccinated person somehow being harmful to unvaccinated, it blew my mind because what was happening was it was the vaccinated folks who were saying, hey, you know, somebody who's not vaccinated is a danger for the society because they would still continue to spread and catch and spread and catch and spread. And here come <laughs> unvaccinated folks, gurus, and they say, well, the vaccinated people are now shedding and they are making us abort and miscarriage and, and smell bad. So somebody had written a comment in some of the video that I was traveling on a train and I could clearly smell somebody and I knew they were vaccinated. Well, it's not necessary that everybody is vaccinated and smelling bad. Maybe somebody is just not very hygienic. So that was just strange. Anyways, Aliji says, why there is no news from China? Please invite someone, doctor from China, and discuss their approach. I don't even know they have an approach. I think they just don't have data. But um, <laughs> it's a good idea to bring someone from there. Paul Burg says, so there doesn't seem to be a question here. Dr. Bean's family has had each of them. He said he preferred Moderna, and I got Moderna. And best one is the one you can get sooner. Correct. That is correct. So my son, older son, got Pfizer. He has now gotten both Pfizer doses. He had more side effects after the first one, but nothing after the second one. I was actually getting him ready to say, after the second one, you're going to have some side effects. The immune system is going to respond. So don't worry about it. 24 to 48 hours will be tough. And he was playing games after getting the vaccine. I had weird side effect after the first one and that was my jaw it just hurt i could not even open my mouth i do not know how i did my talks because it is all about <laughs> moving the jaw and so um, it was very difficult and so that was that and then after the second one i had lesser side effects both time i felt tired and my feeling of tired was that if i'm sitting somewhere i just want to continue to sit if I was lying down, I just want to continue to lie down. So fatigued, sick, and um, down. My younger son had Moderna, 23 years old. He just had the Moderna shot. He had no nothing even after the first one. Nothing at all. And so well, that's these are the two sons and me. My wife had Johnson & Johnson. She still has joint pains, much less now, but even... This morning, she was saying that, hey, if I don't take anti-inflammatory, I get the, the, it reminds me that I have joint pains. So she has talked with her doctor. He has run all kind of tests. Her R effector is negative. Um, her uh, liver functions are fine. Her renal functions are fine. Her complete blood counts are fine. So um, generally, she's fine. But she has the um, uh, joint pains. This is after Johnson & Johnson. So <clears throat> OK. 
Chris Ann says, what is the best approach to heal from COVID pneumonia? Will ivermectin help? How long can COVID headaches last? So Chris Ann, there are some folks who become long haulers in whom this lasts for years or months. I know a patient of mine who I had, I was treating her with hydroxychloroquine. She developed arrhythmia. I stopped her. And a, a year later, she talked with me for some other reason. And she said, hey, you know what? I have developed this. Uh, I, I find it difficult to focus and concentrate and become tired very soon. If I walk a little bit, I become breathless. She didn't know that this was long hauling state. And I immediately identified it. And so she had these headaches and myalgias and breathlessness for, for a year. So I believe there are two prophylaxis to be done. One is a prophylaxis to, to hope to prevent the disease itself. So that is vitamins should be good. The hygiene should be good. Masks, social distancing, hand washing, ivermectin. All of that is part one of the prophylaxis to see if we can avoid the um, disease itself. When the disease occurs, there is another prophylaxis within the disease to make sure that we prevent the long hauling state. And for that, once again, ivermectin is very, very important. Steroids are very, very important. So uh, to your question now, yes, I can't uh, specify it for you. But generally, in my patients, ivermectin. So this uh, woman, 23 years old, who had developed the long hauling state, when I asked her to take ivermectin, she started it. I totally thought that in my next discussion, I will have to start her on steroids. So <clears throat> bad doctoring on my end that when she called me before I asked, how is the ivermectin doing? I just said, you know what? We may have to start you on steroids as well. And she said, but my symptoms are almost gone with ivermectin. Why do I need steroids? And this was my fault. I should have actually asked her that, how is it doing? And so I assumed something that was wrong on me. So this is how it helped. So there is there is a uh, first story in my whole career with working with COVID, where my friend's mother who had developed COVID after two doses of a vaccine. Then when he told me I started her on high dose ivermectin, even then she did not survive and she passed away. Her uh, uh, comorbidity was obesity. There was some, um, we, we were able to give her ivermectin for three, four days. And then she went to a hospital where they started doing things other than what we were uh, saying. But she still had a chance to get ivermectin high dose and she did not survive. So that is my first patient with a failure of ivermectin. So Alexis, please check out Humble Bean's question on the Janish paper. OK, so let's see. Humble Bean. I'm going to go find Humble Bean. Um, so this is an important question as well. Let me just quickly respond to this. Destroyer, sir, how can we avoid mucormycosis to happen? I'm from India. Give some tips. So before this Friday. So I believe Thursday morning, Europe, India, Middle East, Africa chat. First 10, 15 minutes, I talked about mucormycosis and I talked about the management of it. Please listen to that. And I think what I should do is I, I should take that piece out and separately upload it as a video with mucormycosis. But Destroyer, I have talked about it. Maybe if that is not sufficient, I thought I talked about the management, then I can do it again. So let's continue to see Humble Bean's question. Uh, where is it? Where is it? <laughs> or can you hear? Humble Bean, I got it. Question, what do you think of the May 17th article? May 17th today. Reverse transcribed SARS-CoV-2 RNA can integrate into the genome of cultural, cultured human cells and can be expressed in patient-derived tissues. So I was actually going to talk about this. So what happened was I actually tweeted a few days ago. There was another uh, paper where some study from, I believe, Europe 
some researchers had said that the RNA would integrate into our DNA. And I, um, <laughs> I uh, tweeted it. The reason I tweeted that is that I think that you know, Cool Beans and I have developed enough of a um, way of working together that we can actually look at those things that are not really correct, but still look at them and read them and then kind of figure out the mechanism to say, yeah, this is not really correct. But there was at least one person who commented and said, on one end, you don't agree with Geert, and then you also send papers which uh, support Geert. So that was just another one here, reverse transcribed SARS-CoV-2. So this is a very common theory that has been given by some other gurus. Um, I will look into, Humble Bean, if you can uh, tell me where the uh, paper is, I can go over this and um, we'll talk about it. Kevin says, uh, Dr. Bean, good to see you. Same here. Good to see you too. How do you think things are looking globally? Cases going down. So let's look at that together. Um, let me make sure is, there is no other uh, pressing question here because looking at cases would take a little bit of a time, but let's do that. <laughs> okay, so let's let's look at that. <clears throat> Worldometer starting from Israel. My site has just so Israel is just out of it. Done. Then if I go to let's go to the general world first. So here is world. So if you see here, world experienced a one more wave, and now it is going down. So definitely we are doing better i need to just so definitely we are doing better for example on a daily basis seven day moving average now at 663000 or 664000 worldwide compared to 828000 worldwide at one point which is april 28 so from april 28 within 7 8 9 days we have gone from 827 to 663 so quite a good uh, reduction. I am sure that deaths are following a similar path as well. So in general, world is healing and is coming out of it. Now, from various countries' point of view, US, I talked about it in our last chat as well, 33 million cases. I cannot imagine when we were seeing in horror the cases going up in Italy. And that seemed so unbelievable. And here is US, 33 million cases. But here we are, much, much better. Then if you look at UK, and please tell me if there is any specific country you would like me to look at. UK, I can't understand why this last tail is not going away. But they have actually reduced a lot as well. Their active case is 45,000. 45, this was 36,000, 45,000. They used to have it on April 5. Then they used to have it on September 1. So they have really gone down. After their variant and the variant spread and the lockdown needed again. Remember, the variant appeared in September. So that variant is now totally controlled and they're back to normal. So that is good. And this is good that even when they have cases, the number of deaths are really low. So let's see. <clears throat> this is magical. Number of deaths are 11 uh, compared to still a higher number of currently infected cases. So let's see what is the number of daily infections in UK. So 2,200 daily infections, 11 deaths. So that is still a high number from a death point of view. So that is UK. <clears throat> Let's see Pakistan. 
Pakistan's third wave is reducing as well. So they have a they have put one more lockdown in place. And the number of deaths are going down. India. And the reason I said that India, all other states were doing similarly, let me show you um, for India one second. So I'm going to bring in India's link. So So this is India. And if you see here generally, so this is ivermectin, no ivermectin, generally India. So if you see active cases are this blue one over here, they are going down. And so now you would say, well, why are they going down without the ivermectin? So ivermectin is one part. People's behavior is another. Imagine people lying on the roads, not having oxygen, people running around from one place to another place to find oxygen. Uh, uh, somebody had sent me a uh, breakdown of the prices for remdesivir this much and um, oxygen this much and traveling in ambulance this much. So when all of that is happening, then people are dying. Then there, there's not enough uh, place for uh, cremations and so on. So who would not then retract themselves and go back in the home and try to protect them as much as possible? It is just human to protect ourselves. So I think there is a behavioral part as well. And we have to kind of acknowledge that. Uh, there was a misbehavior here when the Kumbh Mela occurred and when the Holi happened and when the election campaigns happened. And I know I, I'll get people commenting that who are you to say this but anyways there was a uh, people's congregations happened that gave rise to this um, this situation many many media outlets say it is because of the variant it's not just the variant it was people meeting and then the variant was an additional thing on top of it and now people are not meeting they're trying to protect themselves so here we are so Within India, if I go here, so just to give you an example, if I go to, let's say, Maharashtra. Maharashtra was badly affected before. And now if we look at it, <clears throat> look at the active cases going down in Maharashtra. So here, I do not know what is exactly the number, about 6 lakh. So lakh stands for 100,000. So 6 lakh would be 600,000. And here, if you see... It is about 410, 50,000. So here, 445,000. Here, 672,000. So the number is here. This is the number. So that is a lot of reduction. Then if I go to, so Maharashtra, I, I'm not sure if Maharashtra generally is using Avramectin or not, but you see the dip is a lot. Then if I go to, let's say, Goa, And I open Goa. Look at this as well. So here 31,000 cases and here uh, 25,000 cases. So, so a similar dip there as well. We'll see more. So again, I'm not discounting ivermectin. I want to also acknowledge that there is a human part in it. And that part is showing. So that is India. Um, what else? UK, Pakistan, India. How about Brazil? Brazil. And by the way, we'll have Dr. Tina Pierce this Friday with us. She has been managing long haulers. She's in UK, has good experience with long haulers. She was part of the Dr. Tess Laurie's conference as well. So we'll have Dr. Tess Laurie this week. Next week, we'll have Dr. Bream who I had done a, a video with him before on his channel. He's joining us. And then we'll also have Dr. Hector Carvalho from Argentina. So maybe before Dr. Bream or after Dr. Bream. So we have some big names coming up. So please be tuned. So daily new cases here in Brazil. So let's see. 
Brazil has definitely came down, but still high. So look at this, 75,000 on March 29. So 18 days later, 63,000. Did you see that almost in these 18 days, almost all countries are going downwards? And I think one of the reason is the human behavior. The other reason could be people trying to find solutions. Uh, I do not think seasonality has anything to do with that. I also do not think in every country the reason is vaccine because many countries do not have sufficient vaccination to say this is attributable to vaccine. So this is good. Brazil is uh, going downwards as well. One million active cases compared to 1.23 million about April 1st. So within 17 days, uh, 1.2 to 1 million. And number of deaths have gone down as well. And I think I um, sometimes confuse folks who think that I should either just talk about ivermectin to be the end all, be all, and nothing else. Or if I talk about something else, then I should be against ivermectin. So folks continue to find clues to say you are pro-vaccine, not ivermectin, or you're pro-ivermectin and not vaccine. I am a doctor who is presenting data to you. And there are data points available in all of these things, good and bad, and we discuss them. I am fortunate that I did not put myself in a corner of pro-vax or anti-vax or pro-ivermectin or anti-ivermectin. I'm not a one-trick pony. I want to share all of this. You can decide for yourself what is the best for you. So uh, this is uh, Brazil. What else? Um, how about Seychelles? If I can correctly spell it. Seychelles. Do we know the spellings of Seychelles? Here, let's see. Serbia, UAE, Malaysia, Greece, Croatia, Palestine, Lithuania. How is Russia doing? Bahrain. Let's see. I do not know the spellings of Seychelles. So let's look at Russia <laughs> till somebody types spellings for me for Seychelles. OK. <clears throat> so this is Russia, 4.9 million cases. And they have become steady at a lower rate as well. All of these cases should actually be seen in the context of the vaccination as well, just to see what are they. Um, so if I go to vaccination. 1.48 billion doses given across 176 countries. That is excellent. And the latest rate was roughly 24.5 million doses a day. Awesome. And then let's see. I thought there will be a spelling for Seychelles somewhere over here too. So let's look at Russia. Russia is here. 8.2% one dose, 5.2% two doses, so not a lot. So Russia, not a lot of uh, coverage yet. So they are stuck at this level. How about deaths are at a higher level as well. Here is Seychelles. So I think I can now write it. Seychelles. Not found. I failed again. I thought it was correct spelling. So let's see, Seychelles. 
So their total cases are going up. Although a small community, but still look at the cases, 1,000 cases and then 580 cases. It seemed like what happened was once the um, vaccination started in Seychelles and more than 60% people became vaccinated, Seychelles opened for um, tourism. And in that tourism, there was no uh, restrictions for infected versus not infected quarantine or those. So that caused a spread. And I think now they're controlling it. So what else? What else? So we're looking at some of these. <laughs> so so this is very good. I actually, somebody actually said this as well. So I just read a comment that said, do the magnet challenge. So <laughs> magnet. I should find a magnet and then do this near my deltoid muscle. People say that the magnet would stick <laughs> to the <laughs> to the nanoparticles that have been intru introduced. Okay, so more questions. Pammy says, <clears throat> so sorry, let me do this. Pammy, one second. Uh, Samina says Bangladesh. So let's look at Bangladesh. My apologies. Bangladesh. So 780,000 cases. The cases are actually going down. That is good news. Look at this. So between April 9, that is when they were at peak. So within seven days, they came down. That is excellent. 45,000 active cases versus on April 15. Actually, no, not within seven days, one month. April 15, 100,000 cases from there to 45. So lesser than 50%. That's excellent. And I'm sure that deaths are. And this, this number of deaths that you're seeing up and down. I want to address something that people send me these comments many times. And that is that, hey, if somebody was going to die, they were going to die. Here, if you see, this chart is not a natural chart of somebody was a bigger cluster was going to die here. That's just how it was written for them. And then a smaller cluster. And I know I'm going to get a lot of uh, pushback on this one from some religious groups. I believe medicine is such an important function that a doctor can be a saint for their patients and can request, if you're religious, can request lengthening of their patient's life and reduction of misery if they are sincere to working for their patients. And similarly, a doctor healthcare professional can mismanage a patient and bring the death to them which was not yet due. That's the belief I had for my whole life. The result of that was I always worked harder to make sure that if I can do anything to try to reduce the misery and illness or improve the chances of survival, I should do that. If I just always say, well, this is how it was. It was written like this. Then I think all of us should just stop managing and just wait for the way the writing is. That I'm not challenging the writing. I'm not challenging the fate. I'm just saying there is a, there is a need for healthcare workers to do better. OK, so this is Bangladesh. Very good. Now let's go back to Pemi's question. Pemi, can high-risk, extremely sensitive patients that normally can't take any vaccine take partial vaccine? Partial vaccine, not incremental dose over an hour, plain partial vaccine. OK, so this is a more of a data point question. Yes, partial vaccine should also try to train the immune system. Now, what is the smallest quantity that would allow the immune system to become trained instead of immune system just not even caring for it? For example, natural killer cells and the macrophages and the lymph would just drain it away and just throw it away. So that was the point of doing these vaccine dose studies in phase two. 
So they have done the dosage studies and then came across or came to the conclusion to say these are the right doses. If you went to a smaller dose, you may still have a response, but you may not have sufficient response. Christine says, there are no Dr. Beans in Toronto. I, I am not happy with Canada. So Colombian Bean says, look at Maldives, 60.3% vaccinated. OK. Maldives. 45,000 cases, cases going up. So once again, I think what we need to understand is what caused it. So if let's say 60.3% vaccinated, the question which would be in my mind, which I would need to answer before I say, is it vaccine related, not related? Number one, is it spreading in the remaining 40%? Did they come in contact with, did the society like Seychelles became confident to say, you know what, we are done. And let me give you an example. I was thinking about discussing this for some days with the cool beans here. And that is, we use the, the herd immunity. <laughs> and on herd immunity, somebody had left a very cute comment on uh, uh, one of the videos on YouTube, uh, my videos, and said they were arguing with each other. <laughs> and one of the person said, you don't understand herd immunity. Herd immunity means herd. It does not mean vaccine-related immunity. It just means herd developing the immunity. I felt it was a cute comment. So here, herd immunity. The concept is more of a <clears throat> more of a uh, statistical and epidemiological concept, and that is, you take the R naught and you say one minus R naught divided by R naught is the the result. And for example, in case of uh, SARS-CoV-2, the R0 was 2.5 to 3%, 3. So the herd immunity requirement used to be somewhere about 66% to 74%, which then some scientists came to try to fudge that to say 84%. And I felt that they were just trying to say, okay, get vaccines. Now, think about it for a second. Let's say we have 10 people here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then out of these ten, six are vaccinated. The idea of herd immunity is that this 60% vaccination allows the community to only have infection from one person to one more person not from one to two or one to three. So it does not stop the infection. It brings it down to a one. So at, at most one person only infects one. So we call it a stable state. Elimination will mean R naught of zero. Now imagine this, Seychelles or some other country, they have some vaccination, virus attacks, First problem, the vaccination itself is not 100%. So let's assume for a second that vaccination would protect out of 100 people attacked, uh, let's say three were going to become infected, but because of vaccine, two were protected and one became infected. So this infection will happen. Then here, let's say out of 100, three will be infected. So this infection would happen too. So now there are one person here getting infected, three people here getting infected, one. Secondly, with the herd immunity, we cannot say that a new person, let's say landing from a different country and who may have an infection. And the society says, you know what? You can come in, we are all, we have reached herd immunity. Who is to say that this person would only come in contact with those who are infected and recovered and are part of herd or asymptomatically recovered part of herd or vaccinated and recovered part of herd. It is entirely possible that this person comes in in a boat 
and the person who is tending him right at the harbor is not vaccinated or infected and recovered or is asymptomatically part of the herd immunity and this person may become sick so this these kind of things have to be looked at when you are looking at the result so for example maldives not the best result here the school of thoughts will do what the corners groups will do what they will say well see 60% of the vaccination ideally they are at a herd immunity and look the the infection has increased and then they would go and pick up some messages from geert who would say this has caused caused enough selection pressure that that has caused escape i can assure you if there were escapes here that would be SAR, beginning of the sars cov 2 and now instead of from wuhan that would be occurring for example from Maldives or from Seychelles or from some other country. And just like Wuhan, from December to January, February, the whole world was stuck. If this is the case, we'll be soon stuck with these. But I can tell you that that is not the case. And then here, of course, unfortunately, the deaths are following that as well. Question is to research is number one, what happened here? The 40%, what is the demographic uh, data here? Is it in those 40% or is it in the 60% plus 40%? If I was going to just make a conjecture, I would believe that some from the vaccinated group are becoming ill and then some from the non-vaccinated group are becoming ill. And that is what's happening. And in the same way, I would also say some who had become recovered from the actual infection they, they are equal to, let's say, vaccinated group. They have recovered as well. They are protected as well. So they may also be, some of them will becoming will be becoming sick as well. Okay, so Columbia bean, Colombian coffee bean. That's the update. Good one. I'll have to go dig to see what is their society's behavior. Doug says, so... The Indian variant is a result of selection pressure from the vaccine? No. So that is, that is what I just explained. That India's, if you look at the India's vaccine, I had just explained that in my previous talk. If you look at the India's vaccination, India, here. 10% total one dose vaccinated, 3% total vaccinations. 3% vaccination means nothing, no acceleration and no deceleration. Yes, these 3% will be a little more safe. They would have a better efficacy of the infection or infectivity, but they are not the ones who are causing variants. In the UK, variants were already there before the vaccine started. Here in India, 3% fully vaccinated. If you were really going to say that the vaccine pressures will cause variants, then here is what should happen. It should emerge from UK, from Israel, from other such countries, number one. Number two, it should escape and not be controllable. It should be SARS-CoV-3 then. Now, I always do this little thing that if somebody says, you know what, I want SARS-CoV-3 to be produced, what, how would it happen in the current scenarios? In the current scenario, the only way SARS-CoV-3 would occur, this is not possible that these guys, the variants, would just in one day vary so much that all kind of antibodies and immune system protections are gone. This, um, the, the worst concept floated in this mix of 7 billion people by someone is vaccination would cause depletion of the immune innate immune arm. That is the worst concept somebody could introduce into the system and cause the churn around that. But let's say these are the viruses and they're variants and they're causing infections. The way for them to become SARS-CoV-3 will be 
enough of an accumulation of change. So here is, let's say, the spike protein. So this is the spike protein. This is the S1, S2, RBD fusion protein. And there is some change here that defeats some antibodies, one out of 100. Then on top of this change, so make this variant prevalent. For example, take nowadays we say that the Kent variant or, or 117 is very prevalent in the world. Make another change on top of that one so that the previous change is still there. And the previous change is somehow not controllable. For example, because the majority is the UK variant, majority of the people who are getting infected and preventing uh, recovering are actually immune to the UK variant. So let's then add, let's say world is not becoming immune to the variant, add more accumulating change on top of it, which is going to defeat some more antibodies. Then on top of it, add more. How many have you to add? I would suspect that you take South African variant. Interestingly, majority of these variants, South African, UK, India variant, Manaus variant, they have a lot of common variation, which means the virus has not really progressed too much. It has not made too much of a difference because three or four mutations are just common, the dangerous one. But continue to add dangerous mutations, dangerous being escapable mutations to the point that all existing antibodies cannot work on them. Then you have a new pandemic from the beginning. That also still does not mean that everybody is going to die. Because with the previous pandemic, not everybody died. And many of us, majority of us, were able to handle it. The problem is just that people can die with it. So it's not recommended to go get the infection. So here. This is what would happen. So can these variants actually reach that point in one year, two years? I don't think so. Can vaccine uh, somehow convince or pressure them or cause selection pressure for them to do this? If that was the case, India would not be the country to look at. You should look at Israel or you should look at UK. Now you should look at US. There are the countries that are more vaccinated with bigger populations that should have uh, Israel, not a big population, but a vaster amount of vaccination. UK and US should, if at all, we're going to have something, it should be then from here, not from 3% vaccinated folks. <laughs> Logic says, do you think that the CDC was right to remove the mask guidelines based on the honor system? That is just so silly on their part. And now they're trying to get ahead of it. I was thinking about this. So I was thinking to talk with Cool Beans to say, let's look at CDC. Let's say you, you believe in CDC. And you believe in CDC saying, uh, ivermectin is not good. So remember, in the terms of uh, credibility, we have to prove that somebody says things that are correct and then we can accept new things from them as well that hopefully they are correct as well cdc on transmission throughout the year they kept saying aerosol or not surfaces or not droplets or not indoors or not outdoors or not and you can go to the web archive and you can just see all the changes i have done that in the past as well so flip, flop, flip, flop, flip, flop, correct? Then comes a the mask. They have been doing the same thing as well with the mask. Flip, flop, flip, flop, flip, flop. But here is a problem. You, you can say, and they say it. They say, you know what? It is an evolving situation. We actually do not know what is right. That is why we are flipping, flopping. <laughs> so then ask them, why are you so sure about ivermectin? When are you going to flip on that one? If you are not so sure here and not so sure here, what makes you so sure here? So that that was the silliest thing. 
So I like it that the people who have gotten vaccine or who are infected and are recovered don't need to have masks. Even those who can prove with the T cell test, which is now an authorized test, to say, hey, I, I am protected. They should be allowed to say, fine, with respect to others. For example, now I go out, I'm two, two doses in, I am hopefully fully protected. What is it, 17? I had it on fifth, the second dose, so almost two weeks. So I still wear my mask, not only for the uh, respect of others, I also wear it for my continued protection. So this is the, uh, they didn't do the right thing. I think they they tried to, <laughs> Doug says, on our system, should we have wax tattoos? Yes, <laughs> Doug, correct. <laughs> you are on the right track. Um, Frank Wilson says, excellent principle and point on ivermectin. Yeah, yeah. The, so either don't, either say, we are always right. And because we are right, look at all of our history. And we are always right because we have a big organization. We have great people. We pay them good salaries. They do their works. So our accumulated brain works much better than Mubin sitting in Cupertino. So because of that, here is our long history of doing good things. And because of that, when we ask you that, hey, don't use ivermectin, listen to us because we are credible. Here, they keep saying we are messing up. And hey, we mess up because we it's a new thing. Go to any of their article and it keeps saying situation is evolving. It may be different. We do not have enough data. But if that is the case, what makes you so sure about this? Why don't you say the same thing here? Anyways, and now I'm ranting. Uh, <clears throat> so very good. Impromptu interview says, it is reported publicly through the Center for Disease Control under vaccine breakthrough. Feel free to look it up. It is correct that they talk about breakthrough as well. I actually shared it a few days ago. They say, breakthroughs can occur and yes that can occur the question is do we have the breakthroughs that have taken over have we gotten a SARS-CoV-3 yet we have not um I Koroticus says, could you address the role of iron in pathogenesis of COVID-19 and possible treatment with lactoferrin and other iron chelators? So Koroticus, I have to look up the data for this one. I have been sent this message from a couple of other people too. But until I look at the data and understand the mechanism, for me to just sit here and theorize something would not be right. I Even when I theorize things, I do them for which I know the fundamentals. Mitch Mander says, how did eight of 50 vaccinated Yankees test positive for COVID? If vaccine is 95% effective, isn't the likelihood of this 0 0.7.8 raised to power 10, 8 in 10 billion? Okay, so I'll have to <laughs> do this effectiveness once more. Uh, I misspoke a few days ago as well about this one. So if you have time, I can explain what it means. And so cool beans, you can tell me it's almost eight o'clock. You can tell me if you want to have it or not, but <laughs> Jenna says right away. So check this out. The 95% efficacy, uh, this particular issue was started by a doctor a few weeks ago who coined the idea, not the term, the idea that FDA has deliberately hidden absolute risk reduction from relative risk reduction to cheat. And they have a bias reporting bias. Now, here is the result of this doctor's message. 
he is right. He can say that, that, hey, man, FDA, why don't you talk about absolute risk reduction as well? And why do you just talk about efficacy? And so let me just do a quick thought experiment with you. Pfizer vaccine. 20,000 people in placebo. I'm rounding up the numbers. They're, the numbers are 18,900 something and so on. 20,000 people in uh, vaccinated. 162 people got infected in placebo. Eight people got infected in uh, vaccinated. I have to get my calculator up now. So one second. So I need the percentages. So percentage is 8 100 divided by 20,000. So that is 0.04%, 0.04% becoming ill, correct? So out of 100, 0 0.04. So what will be one person becoming ill? So bring this 0 0.4, keep accumulating it till it becomes one. So that will be about 25 times more, correct? So for example, 2,500 people will have one infection. Here, 162 in the other case. So 16200 divided by 20,000. And again, my numbers will be slightly different because I'm, I have rounded up the numbers to do this example. So 0.81%. This is now what it is saying on the face of it without going into relative risk reduction and absolute. What we are saying is if somebody is not vaccinated, and out of 100 people, 0 0.8 can become infected, which will mean out of about 120, 125-ish people, one will become infected. So let's make a number here. Out of 130, one will be infected. Here, out of 2,500, one will be infected. Good. One will be infected. The promise vaccines made was when this person becomes infected, we are observing that he would not die, he or she will not die of COVID-19. That's all they're saying. The second part they're saying is we are seeing there is a reduction. So now let's look at the reduction. Reduction is actually instead of 0.81%, we are at 0.04%. That means 0.77% reduction. Correct? Now, this is called absolute risk reduction. The problem is this. When you look at 0.81 and then going down to 0 0.04, that is a significant number. So here you're saying out of 130 people, one will become infected. And here you're saying out of 2,500 people, one will become infected. That is significant. But when you look at this number, you're going to say, well, only 0.77% reduction. That's a very minor reduction. Absolute risk reduction has always to be used with the baseline, the control. Without the control, absolute risk reduction number cannot stand on its own to make sense because people would read this to say, you are saying that if I get vaccinated, I will have a chance, 0.77% chance to improve. And they're going to say, why do I need that? Actually, it is not 0.77% chance. It is absolute reduction of 0.77. But what is the percent difference between these two numbers? is 95%. And how do you do that? You take 0 0.81, 1 minus 0 0.81 divided by 0 0.04, and that is the number you're going to get is 95%. So the efficacy is 95% improvement. That is, if there were 100 people standing, and out of them, one was going to become infected. Now, 0 0.04 will become infected. That means you have to have, instead of 130 people, you need to have 2,500 people to create one infection. That is what it is. Now from there, New York Yankees, they're all vaccinated. Why are they um, infected? 
they could be infected because one of them caught it. And it is vaccines. I have been saying it from ever. Vaccines are not a shield that would now tell the virus, do not land on this person's mouth, nose, or eyes because he is vaccinated. Virus can land. Number one. Number two, once you are vaccinated or if you had the actual infection, your immune system will need 24 hours to 48 hours to respond to the, vac to the infection. Now, till that time, the virus has a chance to grow and grow. Now, if you take variants, new variants that can grow faster, replicate faster, that means within 24 hours, they might repl replicate enough that the person would start shedding and give it to somebody else too. Question to answer is this. Will this person become sick? Did, did they become sick or were they asymptomatic? If they were asymptomatic, fine. This is the role of the vaccine. To get the infection, don't even get bothered. Or even if you're bothered, maybe for one day when the, vac the virus is faster than the immune system, and then when the immune system becomes active, then the virus is gone. Compare that to normal wild infection. If I'm not vaccinated or if I did not have infection and recovered, then my immune system can take anywhere from five days to 17 days. During that time, the virus can really, even especially the new variants, can cause so much of replication and damage that I might actually just die. A vaccinated person may mount a response within 24 hours protecting from a great viral load to develop and protecting the person. That still, I'm seeing with the real life data that there are still people who are after vaccinating, becoming ill and dying. My friend's mother died a few days ago. She was vaccinated, two doses. So this concept here that, hey, nobody would die of COVID-19 I still feel that there is some more factor to see. There may still be deaths because I'm seeing that. But that is, for example, in Israel, they were not able to show any single death yet in the uh, vaccinated folks. I know that then people send me messages, but the vaccine caused death. So I have to see those that what is the vaccine causing death. So back here, I hope if you are asking this question, Mitch, in a more um, curious way, then this person, let's say any one of them who was vaccinated, caught the virus, started shedding it fast, gave it to others as well. They were all players. They are in contact with each other. It is possible. Question is, how much sickness, how many of them died? That is the thing to compare. And I hope now, this is also clear. This is absolute risk reduction, and this is relative risk reduction. So relative risk reduction's benefit is this, to say, when we cannot figure out these three numbers correctly, when we cannot interpret them correctly, then just tell us that, hey, how efficacious is this? It is 95% efficacious. 2,500 people will have to be standing together, and one will get sick and vaccinated or recovered from infection. I know that those who are pro-vaccine, they become upset with me when I say that a person who has recovered from infection is good enough. They want everybody to take a vaccine. And those who are anti-vaccine, they become upset with me to say, why don't you just let us say 0.77 is too small? Correct, it is small, but the baseline is small as well. To which then, Another group comes up and says, see, we told you the baseline is too small. This is not, not an important disease to worry about. And to that, this was controlled, correct, in the US now. We have 330 million people, maybe more. 33 million have become infected. Is that 0.8%? That is 10% of the society. And it is not yet done. It is the vaccines that came and got ahead of it. I'm sure it is asymptomatic patients as well who became 
part of herd. I'm sure it is the 33 million infected people who are, have also become part of herd. So if the vaccine is given to, let's say, 100 million, so those 100 million plus these 33 million is the known part of the herd immunity plus those that asymptomatically became infected and corrected, which we don't know, 5%, 10%, whatever that number is, that number is there too. That is how the infections are going down. So I hope that that answers that question. All right, so <clears throat> so let's do this. Let's stop here. So there's a question. Kathleen says, will you write the data to support not needing jab if had COVID, please? <clears throat> So um, the, the problem is I don't have data because I'm not in a setting to collect this data. My only way to express something is going to be from the scientific methods, mechanisms point of view. From a mechanism point of view, if somebody became ill, healthy person and got recovered in a healthy way, then their immune system has taken care of it, care of it. So uh, I have mentioned many times, why would that person become eligible for vaccination is either their health becomes different and they cannot take care of the virus anymore, or the virus becomes so different that it is very different from the one that got them infection. Cool. <clears throat> so <laughs> with this, there's another question. Um, Uh, Thinapidi Samayal says, my CRP is greater than 100. I have tested for rheumatoid arthritis, ANA test, normal doctor advised vitamin D. Can I get vaccinated when my CRP is high? Is CRP linked with blood clots? So CRP is a marker, is an indicator of the acute phase reactions. So what happens is when we have inflammation going on in our body, many of the cytokines that are developed during the inflammation, they go and work on the liver and they ask liver for help because liver is an important protein maker for our body's needs. B cells make proteins as well. Many all cells make protein, but liver is an important protein makers that are contributed to the body. So Messages come to the liver to say, hey, man, we need some proteins to help us fight this infection or inflammation. So the liver makes many proteins, which are called acute phase reactant proteins. One of them is C-reactive protein. And this takes part in trying to heal the inflammatory process and take parts in that. So CRP's level simply means somebody has inflammation going on. Now, when you have inflammation going on, I cannot advise you specifically to say, take a vaccine or not. That is you and your doctor. I can tell you this. When I got my vaccine, Moderna, before that, I had slight um, irritation in my throat. And that became so pronounced that my jaw was hurting and I stayed. I couldn't speak easily or eat easily for days. Um, my wife had some joint aches and then she took uh, Johnson and Johnson and she had um, continuity of those and it's, the, the pains have so much increased that it is very difficult for her and that is even now. On the other hand, my sons, neither of them showed anything and one of my son is so um, had so many allergies that he would develop hives and once he developed anaphylaxis and we had to call the ambulance and they had to come in and give him EpiPen and steroids and all that. And he had nothing. The second son, uh, he also has allergies and he had nothing as well. So exactly how people are going to react is different. So you have to talk with your doctor and plan it. Now for clotting, C-reactive protein itself is not implicated in clotting, but clotting simply means incorrect antibody formation that would activate the platelets. Who gets it is not known. 
So with this, uh, so there is another question. Kathleen May Orga says, are there any possible IgG antibodies we can draw that show longer lasting antibodies? Are there any possible IgG antibodies we can draw? By drawing, so Kathleen, if your question is that, will we have IgG that will be longer lasting to protect from COVID and either from vaccine or the infection? Of course, the data so far we have is for eight, nine, 10 months. And there are studies that show IgG's presence and immune system's uh, ability to produce IgGs up to eight or nine months. I'm sure there are more studies that are seeing it beyond eight or nine months and we'll see them soon. From the previous infection, SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV, we know that SARS-CoV-2, uh, SARS-CoV-1 related antibodies stayed on for two years and then declined in the third year. So protection was two to three years. And the SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV related T cells stayed active in memory or, or stayed as a memory T cell for 10 years. So from other infections of the related cousin viruses, we can see that this protection will be for longer time, but current data only shows for eight months. So with this, let's uh, st stop today. Please do me a favor. Please like, subscribe, and share. If you would just like it, that is good as well. And then in addition, if you like this work, if you enjoy it, if you want this work to continue, please uh, support us. So you can support us by um, buying me a coffee. It doesn't take PayPal, or you can become a patron, or you can use PayPal link in the description to support this work as well. So with that, thank you very much. And I would see you tomorrow morning. Bye-bye.